morning and welcome to worship at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Walkersboro, Maryland. We're glad you're here with us and we hope you enjoy your service today. A few brief announcements. Now, the first is that the congregational survey that was sent out to judge your feelings on us coming back to in-person worship will close in a few days. So if you haven't had a chance to do that, please do so. If you have some difficulties, just contact the church office and we'll help you through it. Second, a big, big, big thank you to uh, Andre Bailey, Linda Yop, and the Home Depot on McCain Drive in Frederick. They were generous enough to donate us gallons of sanitizer, thousands of gloves, and a thousand masks, plus other things for our reopening efforts. So we're very thankful to Mr. Bailey, Linda, and the Home Depot. And now, a very special occasion uh, this Tuesday, as our own Ray Pettengold will celebrate his 100th birthday. We ask that you keep Ray in your prayers and his well wishes. Now let us quiet our hearts and prepare for worship. 
the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling with God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our numbers. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others and see them welcome to us. We sing in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, meet us. So that we may live and serve you in the newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our baptism refreshes us in your goodness. Our sins are forgiven. Your holy meal provides us sustenance in life. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us pray to the 
gifts. Good Lord God, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for reward, except that of knowing that we do your will, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning. The first reading for the third Sunday after Pentecost comes from the 20th chapter of Jeremiah, verses 7 to 13. The introduction. Jeremiah accuses God of forcing him into a ministry that brings him only contempt and persecution. Yet Jeremiah is confident that God will be a strong protector against his enemies and commits his life into God's hands. The first reading. O oh Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out, I must shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is all around, denounce him, let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed for they will not su succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. Here ends the first reading, the word of the Lord. Thanks to God. Today's psalm is Psalm number 69, read responsibly by the half verse. Surely for your sake I have suffered reproach, and shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my own kindred, and an alien to my mother's children. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. The scorn of those who scorn you has fallen upon me. I humbled myself with fasting, but that was turned to my reproach. I put on sackcloth also, and became a byword among them. Those who sit at the gate murmur against me, and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, this is my prayer to you, at the time you have set, O Lord. In, In your, your great mercy, O oh God, answer me with your unfailing help. Save me from the mire, do not let me sink. Let, let me be rescued, rescued from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the torrent of waters wash over me, neither let the deep swallow me up. Do not, not let, let the pit shut its mouth upon me. Answer me, O oh Lord, for your love is kind. In your great compassion, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant. Be swift and answer me, for I am in distress. Draw near to me and redeem me. Because of my enemies, deliver me. The second reading for today comes from the sixth chapter of Romans, verses 1b to 11. The introduction. In baptism, we were incorporated into the reality of Christ's death and resurrection. We have been made new in Christ through his death and resurrection to live free from sin. The second reading. 
Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here ends the second reading, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
And last week, there was more of a non-confrontational approach to bringing the lost sheep of Israel back into the fold and assurances to the disciples that even though witness to Christ would be hard, Christ would be there for them to the end of days. We often think of Jesus as the peacemaker, and yes, that is exactly who Jesus is, but who is he brokering the peace for? Jesus' arrival here on earth was for the purpose of creating peace between God and humans, not between human and human. Jesus' mission was to reestablish that broken relationship between the children of God and God. Those who reject God and the only way of salvation through Jesus will find themselves perpetually at war with God. But those who come to Jesus in repentance will find themselves at peace with God. And because of Christ's sacrifice, we are restored to that relationship of peace with God. And through that peace with God, we're able to restore peace with our fellow siblings in Christ. But not before we understand that we are to put Christ first in our lives. We should seek to be at peace with all people, but should never forget that Jesus warned we will be hated for his sake. Because those who reject him hate him. They will hate his followers as well. In the early Christian times, it was not uncommon to find households divided as to whether they subscribe to a belief in Christ or not. Therefore, the imagery of the sword in dividing and severing relationships. So this discourse is another way, though, for Jesus to give comfort and strength to the disciples as they are prepared for their mission. A mission that's fraught with danger, betrayal, and personal sacrifice. Jesus tells them that the student is not above the teacher, but that the student should emulate the teacher, which is a direct correlation to them and Jesus. Jesus will be persecuted. He will be assaulted and ultimately give up his life for restoring the peace with God. Which is exactly what he expects his disciples to do. We are expected to exhibit this in our lives. Pretty scary stuff, but this is where Jesus gives us three reasons not to fear the path he has set out. The first being that there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Evil people love darkness because it hides their evil deeds. They conspire in secret to thwart the good. But the Lord will both bring light to the hidden things of darkness and will vindicate the faithful. God will not let evil win. The second reason not to fear is the limited power of those who are against us. They can kill our body, which dies anyway but they have no power over the soul. Only God has power over our eternity, and being a loving, faithful child of God is what leads us to the eternal relationship we all seek. Our witness with Christ at our side, putting Christ above all things, is our peacemaking with God. And the third reason not to fear God is his compassionate love. God, compared, God cares about all creatures, even about the tiny sparrows, birds that in this verse become a symbol of inconsequential value. And the use of the sparrow in this passage assures for us that God is looking out for all beings, no matter how small. And since God takes notice when one sparrow falls to the ground, God will certainly take notice when one of God's children is in peril. It won't be easy, Jesus warns. 
He has not come to bring peace but a sword. The incarnate word of God inevitably creates division in a world where God's unconditional grace is denied and God's demand for justice is ignored and dishonored. The word of God is not experienced as good news for those who determine their worth by those who devalue others. The word of God is not experienced as good news for those invested in systems that maintain a high quality of life for some while others suffer. Think about how that's playing out in our society today. There is certainly a disparity in the way all people are treated in this country and we must find a way to restore our relationship with God to create an environment in which all voices are heard so we're not just whispering in the darkness. There are ways in which we can stand up to be the disciples for those on the margins, those who have been cast aside and those who feel they don't have a voice. I think, though, the most difficult task for us is finding that middle ground where we can all come together to understand each other's perspective. Being able to hear something that might not be comfortable to us but being the person who can listen, we then work to become the sword that conquers the conflict. Now I use this word, the sword, as a metaphor in being able to cut through the tension and injustice to come to real solutions. Not ones based on individual needs of a small group of people, but by being a force to institute change for all people. We truly need to get away from the mentality of what's good for me and get into the mentality of, sorry for the cliche, but what would Jesus really want me to do? And that's easy, as he spells it out in today's gospel. We are to emulate the teacher. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. And what you hear whispered in the ear, Proclaim on the housetops. Jesus calls us to proclaim boldly and publicly that which he has taught us in private. He calls us to shout his teachings, all of them, from the kind of public place that will not hide us from those who are against us. We're to be at the center of town or at the top of our house or we need to be in the churches proclaiming, publicly affirming the goodness of a relationship with Christ, allowing us to reside with God because we have emulated our teacher. We've seen this witness in the world, and it is the witness of the faithful that will be heard. We don't have to worry about those who do us harm or those who do not faithfully promote the values of Christ, our teacher. Christ is empowering us as disciples to be the positive change. For whoever takes up my, does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. We strive to be like the prophet Jeremiah, for we have been enticed by God, and God is prevailing in our lives. When we are derided or mocked or shamed for our stand with God, and we feel that God is not with us, we are comforted with the fire of the Holy Spirit in our heart, guiding us to be God's voice for the marginalized in our world. When we live in an us versus them world, we don't have life. We are separated from God. His sword cuts us away from the walls and boundaries we create so that we may have an abundant life. We, like Jeremiah, feel the fire within us, the power and desire to not hold our witness to Christ inside, to share it with all of the world regardless of the repercussions. Fear of God 
helps us to overcome the fear of people and sets us free to be faithful witnesses. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. Go boldly and shout from the rooftops that God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Do not be afraid to be God's sword in the world. Because much like God loves the simple sparrow, God will always love you.
words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We are here at St. Paul's are continually thankful for the gifts that you share with us. And we ask that you continue to remember the church in your prayers.
Feed all who hunger. Empower all whose voices go unheard. And help us respond to the presiding needs of our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Reigning God, you bless us with guides and caretakers in the faith. As we give thanks for those who have died, increase our care for one another until we walk with them in newness of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. And now, gathered into one with the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy, come, thy will be done, done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Amen.
blessed birthday celebration for Ray. Now go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Thank you.